good start. Um, thank you guys for being here today. And also thank you for being part of Android Makers. Thank you for the users. And today we're going to talk about how quickly you can build an app alone using Firebase. And I guess many, most of you guys are Android developers and you have ever thought about um, creating your own app one day. And I guess most of you, okay, not too many of you, I've said before, okay, I have this idea, but actually I don't have the time to do it because during the day I'm supposed to work and uh, this is a side project, so it requires a lot of time. So we're going to go uh, deeply on how we can achieve or create an app alone and go a little bit faster using Firebase. And for this, we just have to get started and get some motivation about it. And if you look at the uh, Android developers website, it's split into three parts. So mainly the design, the develop, and also the distribution. So the design is you have your idea, you mock, then you put some UI, some UX. So this is mostly the job of the UI designer. Then you have to develop, which is our job as Android developers. And then you deploy your app and mostly on Google Play Store. I think they are missing one part here is the feedback. Um, I think it's a loop, and then you have to design, you develop, you deploy in the stores, and then you get your user feedback. And then you uh, improve your app, and you design it, and you develop it again and again. So if you have to start an app alone, then I suggest you to start with an MVP. It's actually a product with just enough features, and it's to satisfy the early customers, and also to provide feedback for future product developments. If you have to create an app, you might need a feedback system, of course. Then you need maybe some authentication, of course linked to social integration, like Facebook, Twitter, so the user can sign in to your app more easily. Analytics, which is part of the feedback system. You might need some remote control because sometimes you make assumption. You don't know if the user are going to use the app the way that, that you design it. So you have to make sure that you remote control some features. You might want to do some notification as well. And as Android developers, we have to make sure that we have some device compatibility with um, the devices and also the Android OS version. And uh, make sure to have the permission the test, the architecture, like architecture components, or the clean architecture. And if you start today, maybe you want some coffee as well. And maybe you have to learn coffee. So you might ask, why Firebase here today? Because we consider using Firebase product to be more focused on user feedbacks. So it means that Firebase is not the answer. I'm not here to like do some app for Firebase. It's just here to make sure that you create your app faster with Firebase. So Firebase could help you. And if I take the list back, then you can see that some Firebase products are actually solving some common challenges when you're creating an app. And the benefit is Firebase is free, but limited. But since you're creating an app, you don't have so many users, so it's OK. It's also scalable. So as soon as your app grows, then Firebase works. And also, as I said just before, it's solving common challenges. So basically, if your app grows, then you can be more focused on technical aspects, like later migrate to your proper backend, for example. And if your app does not grow, then it's OK, because you have your feedback system from your users. So you don't have to hesitate to break things. And it's what we're going to see. It's the way that you integrate some Firebase product and then make sure that one day you can be able to remove them, for example. So what I wanted to show you is how I can split Firebase into two parts. Um, it's like the infra parts, so some product like Cloud Firestore, storage, function, the authentication, and also some product to give you more feedback from your users, like the crash index, some analytics, the remote config, and also the messaging. What is great with Firebase is as soon as you have your build.gradle, you can embed the dependency right here. It's as simple as 
implementation here. So this is the new one with 15. And when you want one day to get rid of this, you just have to remove the implementation and make sure that you remove the dependencies. So let's have a little look uh, deeper on some Firebase products, like the core one. Core product is about analytics, and it's very easy to integrate in any app. Basically, it's four steps. So I just, as I just said, you have to add your implementation. Then, I guess most of you guys are working with some kind of base activity or base fragments. So if you are using uh, Kotlin, then you just have to declare your Firebase analytics. Um, on Apache, if it's a fragment, then you pass the context. And thanks to Kotlin as well, if you have to log, um, this is from the Neos app, where I'm logging some e-commerce purchase, as soon as the user is paying for something, then I want to log this. You can create your bundle, and then thanks to the apply function, everything is in, my, in one block. So Firebase is even providing you some events, and also some parameters. And the last step is when you want to test your analytics. Sometimes it's very difficult, but thanks to Firebase, we have deeper view. So it's just as simple as setting some properties here. And for this reel, I just made an e-commerce purchase, and you can see my parameters are visible from the Firebase console, so I can test very easily. So th this is very simple to get some analytics in your app. And if you want to have crash analytics, for me, I consider crash analytics as, as well as a, as a user feedback because you get some crash and you have to get some step to reproduce the crash. And maybe you want to contact the users. So crash analytics is very easy to implement. Um, the documentation on the website is not up to date because they're providing you the set transitive, but actually you can get rid of this. You just need to add this line implementation. And when you're in, Using crash analytics in your app, maybe you want to enable it for your real time release and also disable it for your defaults. <coughs> and it's very easy in crash analytics to make sure that you disable your debug builds. It's just as simple as adding a metadata here, and it's called Firebase Crash Analytics Collection Enable. So you set it to false, and uh, if you want to disable it on your debug, I suggest you just create an Android manifest in the debug folder, and um, thanks to the Android manifest merger, you can see that metadata are automatically merged. So as soon as you build a debug build, it will add automatically the metadata. So it means at any moment when you build a debug, then you add the metadata, and crash it is disabled. I don't know if you are using Timber, um, I didn't wrote this, I just made some slight modification. It's from the Crash Ethics tree from uh, Jake Walton. I just made the tag. And the idea behind the Crash Ethics tree using Timber is I'm loading using Crash Ethics object, exception, and priority. By priority, sorry. And if you're using Kotlin, then you just have to create a log manager with two functions. The object here is kind of a singleton. You pass the init, in my case, the default is the tag here and the, the application name. And for the debug, I create timber debug tree. And for the release, I'm creating, I'm planting my crash ethics tree with the tag and also setting the user identifier. And in the Neos app class, then it's very easy. I just have to build config debug, initialize fabric with the module crash ethics. Don't forget this line, otherwise, it will not going to work, and then I'm setting the app name directly. And when there is some crash, I have two benefits from this. You can have the step to reproduce, so I know that the user who has this crash just open this screen, then scan some barcodes, and then another crash. So it's very easy for me to have the steps to reproduce. And even if it's not enough, since I pass the user ID, I get the data here. So if it's very hard uh, but to reproduce, then since I have the user ID, I have his email, so maybe I can contact him and get his feedback. So that's it for Crash Ethics. The remote config, we had some example uh, on the Neos app where we were scanning some items. And when the user is using his camera, he has to scan, and there is some delay to scan again. So we were not sure about the time of the delay between each scan. 
So we made a remote config here and changed it. And we assume actually that the delay was two seconds and actually some user said that it was better with four seconds. So we just changed it with the remote config. So if you have the remote config and you're using Dagger, then I suggest you to create a Firebase model. So this is kind of obvious here that I'm going to create a Firebase module with an instance. But as I said before, what you have to take care of is when you inject some dependency, you have to be sure that one day you're going to put them off afterwards. So having this, it's like putting all the Firebase stuff into one module. And to use the remote config, it's kind of very easy at, at the end because you have to inject your Firebase. You have some setup, the init and fetch. So this is uh, from the doc, basically. You just have to have set some default with the XML of your default values, and then you fetch the value to the, from the server. So on your base fragment here, I inject the Firebase remote config with the Firebase analytics. And if I need to use um, a value from the Firebase remote config, like the real sharing, if you're using Kotlin, I suggest you to use the lazy delegate so you don't set the value at runtime, that you retrieve it from the server as soon as you need it. So in my example, if I'm just sent, uh, starting an intern, then the real sharing is going to be automatically set by lazy from the remote config. A little talk about messaging. Um, as you might know, two weeks ago, about two weeks ago, um, Google has deprecated GCM, so you might need to migrate to FCM anyway, so you might need to set up your app with uh, uh, Firebase at some point. Okay, let's go a little bit deeper and with the infrastructure product, like the authentication. Uh, there is two ways to authenticate using Firebase. There is the one with using the Firebase SDK, where you have the full control on your views. And also Firebase team is providing you this GitHub uh, project called Firebase UI, and it helps you to easily sign in to your Android app. In this example, I used the Firebase UI um, screen, and it's just an email, it's just a password, and it says welcome. So you can have some control about the cohort here, but the day that you want to have full control, then you just get rid of the Firebase UI and you make your own implementation using the Firebase SDK. What is great with Firebase UI is that they are taking care of a lot of things for you, and especially the smart lock support, uh, the forgot password, and all the state machine here is very complete, so it, they are doing a lot of things for you, and it's working well. How to use it? Just add another dependency, Firebase UI, as well as Firebase Boot. And then, let's take again our Firebase module, very trivial. And what we are doing is, I just init the Firebase code, I inject it. And as soon as my user, so basically on Firebase, if you don't have any current user, it means that the user is not logged. So as soon as my current user is new, then I can start an activity, and I'm starting the Firebase activity where I set signing instant builder. And this start for results, so in the results, I just have to do whatever I want, so in this case, I just love successfully you know, sign in. And you can manage all the kinds of kids. For the sign out, using um, the OTI, it's very simple. You just call sign out, and then you have your complete listener, for example, to redirect your user to the login screen. But there is an issue with this, is you are putting all the user, all the, your user database into Google servers. So at some point, one day, you might want to migrate to your backend, and the issue is that all the user is inside Google servers. And there is this tool called Firebase CLI, and it's a little bit of Node.js, but not too many, and I just literally run these five uh, comments here. There was some yes, yes, yes uh, between, and uh, I was able to export whether in CSV or JSON the older user from my Firebase database. So what means means that actually one day I can migrate easily from Firebase to my proper backend. 
you have to take care of that one thing is if you're using Firebase, then you have your user has a token, and you have to make sure that the token is correctly sent to your user. Otherwise, it's going to be signed out. There is this new product called Firestore, or I understand Firestore Beta, uh, so be careful with it. Uh, they didn't change anything in two, one or two months, so I think they are almost ready to release it. It's a document database where you have actually some collection and documents. It's like a new NoSQL database. Um, there is only three rules to know that there is a collection that only contains documents inside, and documents can contain other documents, but they can point to sub-collection, like you have your partners pointing to a document, pointing to a collection of stores, and then pointing to documents. So it's very trivial. And the third rule is that the root has to start with the collection. Again, let's provide a Firebase Firestore in our Firebase module. And what is very important here is since it's a database, then it has to be on your data layer. So if you're using clean architecture, then make sure that everything goes to the data layer. So what we are doing most of the time is we're using a repository pattern. So create, let's create a repository module as well. And this is going to stand for the whole process of your app because you just designed the repository module. And as parameter, we're going to specify a first store, for a store address. Maybe later you will have your retrofit class, for example. And in your data repository, for a store, as parameter, then you have your function, get store. And what I'm doing is I edit a single of a list of store domain. And this is very easy using Firestore because what I'm doing here, I'm encapsulating the, the listeners, so the add on success listener and the add on fear uh, listener. And uh, thanks to the query to object, I'm able to query it from the Firestore. I'm able to convert directly my raw data into a store domain. So the day that we get rid of Firestore, then what I have to do is just ask I, do, I don't have to create another method. I just have to change the block inside and make sure that I'm editing a list of store domain. Firestore comes with some security rules and uh, it's very trivial as well. You have the service, Cloud Firestore. You have the, um, let's see, the match here database pointing to your database and then you have your match alone so basically you can specify for this store or this store id then the user can read or write if there is this condition let's have a better example here we are using firebase authentication so basically what i can say is if the request is from a user signing with using firebase code, then it can have access to the resources. There is another one called Cloud Storage. And Cloud Storage is a powerful, um, simple, and also cost-effective object storage service. And the Cloud Storage for Firebase also provides you security rules. And it helps you to upload and also download to your app some resources. And we will see that it's actually acting the same way as Firebase, uh, Firebase Firestore, sorry. So basically, we just provide the Firebase storage, the same as the Firebase Firestore. And we're going to add it to our repository model, Firebase storage. So again, one day you can get rid of it and replace this by a retrofit service. And it's going to be the same in your data repository. You will have store logo URL or whatever, get the value here from the bucket. And you just have to know one thing is uh, on the storage, you have to get a reference. And for example, here what I'm doing is I'm passing in the bucket the store, the logo from the uh, Grand Epicerie de Paris, Rive Gauche, so GDP Rive Gauche. And I'm downloading the real. And then I can do whatever I want with it. 
And if you're using Firebase UI, they also implemented um, a module for Glide that's helping you to directly download. It's like using Picasso. Uh, you get your URL and it's loading directly in your image. So this is very trivial using Firebase UI. You have to specify your Glide module. And then, if you want to load any picture um, from cloud storage into your image view, then you just have to put the three lines of code with Glide apps with the context, then you load your storage reference you got from um, the cloud storage. And as I said before, cloud storage is exactly like Firestore, so you have the structuring security rules as well. You just have to change the service. You have to match with the bucket you have. And then it's very easy. You can read, write, and if the re request uh, is coming from someone that is authenticated, then he is able to download the, the, the raw data or the image. So I think we covered most of the part of the Firebase product. And uh, if you have any question about this, I suggest you to join this Slack. Um, they are not pushing it too far, but actually they are answering very fast, and there is a community on the Slack account that is very pushing on improving the product. So they are taking into account the developer issues, and they can help you with this. So that's it for my talk. Um, I hope that it got you motivated for creating your own app. And uh, you can see that using Firebase actually helps you to boost your productivity, to be more focused on user feedbacks and also on your user um, feature aspect more than on your technical aspect. And uh, as I said, you have the community behind you. So if you have any question, I'm here to answer them. Otherwise, if you have more deep questions, join this Slack. Thank you. Website, they're explaining all the details about this. Um, what I can say is they use the databases and then they got rid of it for Firestore. It's because they had some scale, scale issue with it. And Firestore is a brand new redesign of database. So at some point, I think they are going to deprecate it, completely the database, and migrate to Firestore. So every no, 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 cloud storage. No, I was talking about so database. So cloud storage is fine, and uh, I don't think they're going to remove it. It's okay. working with the buckets, so it's exactly like uh, an Amazon S3. And you can use them, you have the GS Util. And, uh, it's something, a tool that you can use as well on the Play Store to get all your stats. Uh, so just if you have the Play Store, you can install it. And you can also retrieve your buckets using this CRM. But so what's, uh, what's the difference between Firestore and Cloud Storage for not losing the kind of data? Um, Firestore is a database, and uh, Cloud Storage is a bucket, actually. So F3, basically Amazon F3. Maybe a last quick question? Can you program, <coughs> sorry, can you program in Kotlin? With Firebase or Java or you you are meaning uh, the CLI? Yeah. Um, I read some talks. Uh, there is a wrapper for. Um, I, I didn't mention this uh, cloud function here. Uh, you might have heard about this. And the cloud function are something that if you have Firestore, then you can do some logic on the server side use, using the database. So you have to design this. 
And it's very powerful because, for example, as soon as there is this kind of event coming in your Firestore, then you have some call function that can, for example, trigger some messaging notification to your user. And I've seen some, um, it's like early process, but the JavaScript, they are going to migrate this and make a wrapper so you can write in Kotlin and it's embedded through Espresso and, uh, and then it's working very fine so you can design your your cloud function with Kotlin actually and just wrap it and then it's going to be in, in the JavaScript on the cloud function side. So you can write uh, it, I can link you the the, the topics with it. Uh, it's very easy actually uh, to, to do it with the uh, Okay, so thank you.